Hello and welcome to the Oracle's Classroom. In this episode, uh, we're going to try something different. I saw on a value investing uh, social media page, someone asking about how to calculate tangible book value and the difference between book value and tangible book value. So the first your company, uh, one of the first companies that came to mind, uh, which I hope is a good example, is Kraft Heinz. So we have here Kraft Heinz uh, 10K report for the uh, 2019 uh, year end. And uh, I've been in here before, so we'll just jump right to the balance sheet. So what I like to do when I'm typically looking at companies, I like to use the company level data. Uh, it's just how I tend to look at and value companies. Uh, but you can certainly break any of this down into per share data. And uh, we'll, we'll do that uh, at the very end. But uh, here, here's the Kraft Heinz uh, consolidated balance sheet. So... Uh, just very, very simply, um, you know, we can find here uh, in the liability section the stated amount of, of total equity. Now, you can either grab this uh, total equity figure, uh, which includes the minority interests or the non-controlling interests, uh, or you can grab this one right here, uh, which is just the, uh, the equity that would represent uh, the public shareholder. So I, I tend to use this figure right here. So we'll just go ahead and plug that in to our spreadsheet here. So um, we'll just call this, you know, reported uh, shareholders equity. So we'll put this in. Uh, we'll just use the numbers uh, 51623. And uh, just as a good good habit, I guess, just to keep this clean, you know, we'll just uh, we'll do this. So we know that this is in uh, millions. So this figure here is uh, actually 51.6 billion. So so here's uh, here's the equity. So uh, this would be, Kraft Heinz's book equity. Now we can um, we can input the number of shares. Uh, we could we could do it down below. We could do it in another column. Uh, why don't we just use this right here? So sometimes uh, these companies have the number of shares listed right here on the balance sheet. Other times you have to search for uh, you know outstanding shares, something like that. Uh, but we can see here <clears throat> that uh, Kraft Heinz had at the end of 2019, uh, let's see here, 1.224 shares issued and 121 outstanding. So we'll use that 1221 figure. So billion one shares. So we can simply take uh, take this number divided by the number of shares gives us the tangible, or excuse me, gives us the uh, per share value for the Kraft Heinz uh, equity. <clears throat> So that's that's pretty straightforward. Uh, this is the number that you would see if you went to uh, you know a Morningstar, or Yahoo, and so forth. That's just sort of the headline. You know, just very basic. They just take the shareholders' equity line divided by the number of shares. So that's that's pretty simple. Uh, we won't get into diluted shares uh, today, so we'll just keep this very simple. <clears throat> uh, so. When we go from the reported shareholders equity, so that would just be the book value. You know, you would be right in saying the book value of the company is 51.6 uh, billion or $42 per share. Now, just very basic, uh, basic finance, the 
uh, assets and liabilities have to offset each other. They have to equal. And uh, the residual value between the assets and the non-shareholders' equity liabilities is the shareholders' equity. Now, uh, someone once said, I think it was even Buffett himself, said, you know, the liabilities on a balance sheet uh, are always, always, always rock solid. It's the assets that can be uh, subject to change uh, or, uh, you know, sale less than, than what they're reported. Uh, but these liabilities on the balance sheet, uh, we can just assume are rock solid. So because the balance sheet must balance any changes in the equity and the asset side you change one dollar here these liabilities stay the same so that the, tr the change is a direct hit to shareholders equity so uh, just to use one example uh, inventories uh, Kraft Heinz I think ketchup so uh, let's just assume uh, the company bought a million dollars worth of tomatoes and so it puts those on the balance sheet. Everything looks the same as we see here. And all of a sudden, that million dollars worth of tomatoes, they find out they're bad for whatever reason. They have to junk them. Uh, those would be written off. So instead of 2721, you know, it'd be 2720. That $1 million liability still hold. So that $1 million would be a direct hit to the shareholder's equity account. And so we can kind of use that framework for analyzing the tangible book value of a company. So the, the two main accounts uh, which are intangible are uh, goodwill and then just straight intangible assets. So, you know, we can just right here, just say goodwill, we'll put the number in uh, as a negative um, because we're backing it out of the asset side. So that's a direct hit to equity. So 35, 546. Now, what we can do, I'm just going to clean up this here, and I'm also going to make a hard reference here so we can quickly drag this down and see the effect on the per share. So uh, goodwill, and then we have intangible assets, net and so those are uh, 48,652. And again, we'll drag this down and we'll just uh, make it look nice and neat. So if we take, uh, basically add those figures with uh, the goodwill and the intangibles being a, a negative, uh, we're going to get the tangible book value, which in the case of Heinz is actually negative. And we'll talk about in a minute whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. So, so that's, that's the straightforward calculation. So you can say Kraft Heinz has a reported book value of about $42 and a tangible book value, which is negative. Now, just like we did with uh, the inventories, that hypothetical, you want to dig in and see what these numbers uh, are comprised of. So uh, goodwill is simply just the excess purchase price that a company has paid for another business. So in the case of Kraft Heinz, when Heinz bought Kraft, it was a huge premium, and that premium was reflected in Goodwill. Uh, so we can go to, in this case, page 68 of the 10K, and we can see that 35 by 46 balance at the end of the year, uh, which is right here. Um, we go to page 71. These are uh, intangible assets uh, typically classified into two very broad categories, indefinite lived intangible assets, uh, in this case, trademarks, things like that, which uh, when you, most of them, when Heinz purchased Kraft, uh, the company said uh, these 
trademarks of our brands are valued at X and we're going to put them on the books uh, for that much. So that's how they allocated that. Um, but they could be other things um, in that account as well. And then the second major category could be the uh, definite uh, live and tangible assets, which uh, these are actually amortized. So trademarks, you know, some brands just decline over time and they're amortized. Uh, there's usually a customer related asset that gets put on here, uh, which is also amortized too. And so it's really up to the analyst to say, okay, what, what is tangible versus intangible? Um, you think about an account like accounts receivable, you know, is that tangible? It's not like a piece of property, but you know, it really is a tangible asset and something like uh, software, for example, uh, you know, an analyst might say, well, that's really, um, that's really an asset I want to include in book value. And what I'm really trying to do is just take out, uh, you know, that pure goodwill and they might make that adjustment, but it's really really up to the analyst to decide uh, what that is. But at the very least, uh, you should understand what is in those accounts that you can make an informed judgment. Now, the question arises, uh, you know, what's, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Well, uh, you know, just to go back to a very uh, sort of nostalgic era when uh, companies were mostly manufacturers, and the assets in the books, you know, typically were cash, receivables, inventory, uh, and some property, you know, buildings and land. That that land was was tangible. You know, that was that was on the balance sheet uh, as as tangible, and um, if valued appropriately on the balance sheet, that land translated into. Uh, because it went through, subtract the equity, the liabilities, and it translated into tangible book value. So the reported book value and the tangible book value were often identical. Now, companies that have uh, intangible assets uh, like Kraft Heinz, if Kraft Heinz were to liquidate itself, um, there might be some value in the brands that someone would pay for, but if you know, in theory, if all that Kraft Heinz could get when it liquidated itself after paying its creditors, that there would actually be nothing left because this goodwill is really just a plug number. And if uh, no one was willing to pay up for the intangible assets, those would be worth uh, nothing. So there, there would 48 billion would, would go off the balance sheet and there would be not, not enough left to satisfy creditors in that case. Uh, intangible assets. So, so is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, uh, in the early days of the manufacturers, again, for a company to grow would require additional capital. If it was to double the business, it would need, you know, in theory, twice as much manufacturing space, uh, office space, maybe, and that was expensive. In the case of uh, a company like Kraft Heinz, say. They, those intangible brands really don't cost them anything. So uh, to, to double their output, they may need to invest something in the plant. But if, in, in theory, if those intangible assets are worth as much as they are, and the company's doing more business, they don't have to invest any additional funds into those intangible assets while that volume increases. So it can actually be a very good thing. Uh, and a company like Apple, you know, which has um, basically no, uh, it, it costs almost nothing for, for Apple itself to create its, you know, the value of Apple is in its intellectual property. It, it really requires no, no capital to operate. So we can, we can see from the case of Kraft Heinz, you know, this is a company where it's selling, it's, ha it's had some struggles as of late, but you know, $25 billion worth of product and it's making $5 billion pre-tax. So here's a company where uh, clearly these intangible assets have some value. Now Kraft Heinz, uh, I wanted to use this as, as an example as well because Kraft Heinz recently, over the last couple of years, has had some uh, goodwill impairment losses. 
So what the company has said is because of its brands struggling in the marketplace, they are not worth as much as they formerly were. So those intangible assets, we thought they were worth that much. They're actually worth less because they're not producing as much in sales or profits. So they knocked down the value of the intangible assets by running, in this case, uh, $7 billion in 2018 and a billion two through the income statement. They did that as well uh, with the intangible assets category. So those were non-cash charges, uh, but those are real impairments to the Kraft Hind brand, or at least uh, the company concluded that, and we can uh, we can make uh, make the assumption that they're correct in that. And in fact, they're probably on the optimistic side. Um, but an analyst can go through and decide what they think uh, the assets are worth and make an adjustment to the equity account. That's nothing that. Um, just because the company says something is the way it is doesn't mean that it definitely is so. So that's sort of the um, that's sort of the mechanics of going about calculating tangible book value uh, and uh, reported book value. Well, one thing that is uh, often very useful to do, uh, and this may be the subject of another video. But uh, from a stockholder's equity standpoint, uh, the Kraft Heinz company re requires no, no tangible equity to operate uh, because one after we back out those two figures. But it actually does require um, a, a, an amount of tangible capital to operate. And in the case of Kraft Heinz, that capital is supplied by creditors. So uh, because of the strength of the brand and its history, lenders have become very comfortable lending to the Kraft Heinz company. So to the tune of uh, $28 billion of long-term debt, uh, almost $30 billion if you include the current portion, and then it has uh, payables, which fund some of its assets and some other liabilities here. Uh, we can also take the other approach to say that uh, just using some very, very broad numbers and not uh, adjusting the cash here uh, you know two billion of, of cash another, maybe another two billion of uh, receivables uh, two billion three billion of uh, inventory so that gets us to uh, roughly seven billion we have uh, property and equipment which of course is uh, is needed that's another seven so that's 14 and uh, the trade just in the course of business funds about four of that. So, you know, roughly speaking, the Kraft Heinz company requires 10 billion worth of uh, tangible capital supplied by both creditors and uh, company shareholders. And it's generating that, that 5 billion of pre-tax uh, earnings each year. So uh, on that very broad, very rough analysis, a 50% return on total capital pre-tax which gives an indication that the Kraft Heinz company is uh, is worth something over its uh, negative tangible book value, that those intangible assets are worth something. Uh, maybe they're not worth this much, uh, but it's really up to the analysts to decide uh, and the market to decide. So the market is saying that in the case of Kraft Heinz, its tangible book value uh, is basically irrelevant and the market is valuing the company uh, in the in the tens of, of billions of dollars. So uh, hopefully this was of use to you. Uh, if you've uh, stuck around this long, I uh, certainly appreciate uh, your time. Uh, if you have, uh, if there's anything that I really wasn't clear about, please let me know if there are other topics or companies that you would like to look at. Uh, we can certainly do that uh, together in something like this. Uh, tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, thank you for watching. Please uh, like, subscribe, share, uh, join the conversation, check out uh, theoraclesclassroom.com and uh, sign up for our newsletter. It comes out every week. It has uh, all kinds of goodies about uh, Berkshire's history and current events. Uh, so hope you all uh, have a great day and uh, stay rational.